In this video, we use the insights from the labor market to derive the so-called Phillips curve, a negative relationship between the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. As point of departure, we have the empirical relation between wage inflation and uh, the unemployment rate that William uh, Phillips observed in Great Britain from 1861 to 1957. He observed a negative relationship between the two. And this was then called the Phillips curve relationship. And it was subsequently observed for many economies. In some of them, it was more pronounced and others less pronounced. And here I've just plotted for the United States, the Phillips curve with monthly data from 1948 to 1972 from the FRED database, uh, this relationship. And we see that there is a slight negative association um, if we um, include a trend curve. Uh, and at least during that time period, it used to be uh, significant. Superficially, the Phillips curve suggests a trade-off for economic policy. So they could just accept higher inflation to get lower unemployment. And historically, this was actually tried. So uh, uh, governments tried to exploit the Phillips curve relationship, but it didn't work out. When tried, inflation actually spiraled upwards in the 1970s in particular, and it spiraled out of control. The relationship broke down in the late 1970s for US data, so it could not be found there anymore. Then from a theoretical perspective, the Phillips curve has been modified. Um, such that also the periods afterwards are captured, uh, in particular, and most importantly, to take into account inflation expectations, because people's inflation expectations might adjust to economic policy that tries to exploit the Phillips curve relationship, and that's an endogenous reason for why it could um, um, vanish in the data. Uh, and uh, basically, it has been shown that these um, modifications of the Phillips curve were quite successful afterwards. We now implement this Phillips curve relationship into the framework that we had um, uh, so far. And afterwards, we will derive a framework for the medium run, the ISLMPC framework, basically. But first of all, we derive the Phillips curve relationship mathematically. And here we rely, as I said, on the previous set of slides and the previous video on the labor market, where we had the price setting equation and the wage setting equation. And we can now plug in the wage from the wage setting equation into the price setting equation to get uh, the price level expressed in terms of the markup, so the bargaining power of firms, the expected price level, and the function f of u and z that we had from the wage setting equation. Now uh, we suppose that there is a functional form for this function f that actually captures the negative relationship between uh, the price and uh, unemployment um, uh, or the wage here in the wage setting equation and the positive association with um, the catch all variable set. And this is just as in Blanchard um, a simple linear relationship here where we have that f of u and z is 1 minus alpha u so this captures the negative dependence uh, of f on u plus z which captures, captures the positive dependence here and then we can just plug this in here and get the relationship as it is written down uh, here um, with a linear term uh, at the end now we want to derive the Phillips curve relationship or this relationship actually but we are now not so much interested in this expression here in levels, so in the price level and the expected price level, but in changes of the price level and changes of the expected price level, in other words, in inflation rates. So we now rewrite this expression by noting that the inflation rate is defined as the growth rate of the price level, which is PT minus PT minus one divided by PT minus one. And a similar expression holds true for the expected um, price level and expected inflation. So we can rewrite um, this here such that the price level of the previous period uh, of this period divided by the price level of the previous period is one plus the inflation rate. And the expected price level for today divided by the previous price level is the expected inflation rate. And then we can plug this into the expression that we had on the previous uh, slide. Basically, mathematically, this would follow by just 
computing the change over time of this expression here, where p and pe are variables, and these uh, here are parameters that are constant. In this case, one would then get the Phillips curve relationship in changes of the price level or in inflation rate. So we would have 1 plus the inflation rate on the left-hand side from here. We would have 1 plus mu you know, still from uh, this expression here. We would have 1 plus the, infl the expected inflation rate from this expression here. And we still have the term 1 minus uh, alpha ut plus z from here. And next, we for, uh, perform some um, simplifying steps uh, that lead us to the PC equation as it is usually used in textbooks, also in uh, the book by Blanchard. This simplification is that we divide the previous expression by 1 plus the expected inflation rate and 1 plus mu. So from here, we would shift these two terms to the left-hand side and the right-hand side would be equal to 1 minus alpha ut plus z, which we have here. And then one can note that for low inflation rates and low expected inflation rates, and a comparatively low markup, actually, mu, we could rewrite this expression here as an approximation, as 1 plus the inflation rate from the numerator, that's clear, but then we don't divide, but subtract the um, expected inflation rate here and the bargaining, uh, the, the, the market power of firms here. And this can be done as long as pi te and mu are not too large. As long as these expressions are close to zero, this approximation holds reasonably well. Well, and then we can plug in this expression here instead of the term here on the left-hand side of this equation. And then simplify by, for example, cancelling out uh, the one here, uh, bringing uh, expected inflation to the right-hand side, the mu term to the right-hand side. And what we get is an exp expression of the inflation rate as a function of the exp expected inflation rate, the bargain, uh, the, the, the um, market power of firms, the catch-all variable set, and the unemployment rate u. And now we see that there's features an inverse relationship between inflation and the unemployment rate. So that's this Phillips curve relationship. But we will see later on its expectations augmented and what this actually means, we will discuss next. So we have this basic expectations augmented Phillips curve where the inflation rate is now determined by actually um, three different uh, components, the expected inflation rate. That's clear, if people expect high inflation, they would want to bargain for higher wages. That would in turn increase cost of the costs for, of production for firms. And this will in turn increase prices uh, further. So this first relationship is clear. Now inflation also increases with an increase of the markup or with an increase of the catch-all variable set. And this is because either such an increase increases the market power of firms so that they uh, can um, enforce higher prices, or the market power, or the negotiation power of um, labor unions in wage negotiations, which leads to higher wages again, which in turn leads to higher costs for firms, and this in turn leads to an upward pressure on prices. So it's clear that these two terms enter positively. And finally, we have that inflation ceteris paribus decreases in the unemployment rate, because that a higher unemployment rate would reduce the wage negotiating power of um, uh, labor unions and therefore lead to a downward um, pressure on cost. So now we move to the medium run and assume that prices adjust fully such that they are consistent again with price expectations. So in this case, it would also mean that inflation and inflation expectations coincide. The reason is here that households form expectations rationally, and they cannot be fooled permanently. This means that a policy that raises the inflation rate above the expected inflation rate um, would be um, understood as such by the households, and they would revise their expectations upwards, basically. So in the medium run, then it holds that uh, inflation is equal to expected inflation, and we have from this expression on the previous slide, if we bring in expected inflation to the left-hand side, that we have pi t minus pi te, and this is equal to zero due to this assumption here. And then we see on the right-hand side, we still have mu plus z minus alpha times ut, 
So we can use this expression to solve for the equilibrium unemployment rate, which is the natural unemployment rate here, which would be equal to the um, market power of firms plus the catch-all variable set that increases the power of labor unions divided by alpha, which is the parameter here that measures the responsiveness of the inflation rate to changes in unemployment. And then we can just express alpha times un by mu plus z, and we can plug this into the Phillips curve relationship that we had on the previous slide. And then we can derive an alternative formulation for the Phillips curve, which is then stated as a deviation from the equilibrium level. On the left-hand side, we have a deviation of actual inflation from expected inflation. And on the right-hand side, we have a deviation of the unemployment rate from the natural unemployment rate multiplied by alpha, which is this responsiveness parameter here. Well, and now we can try out what happens in different specifications. First of all, we could assume that we have anchored expectations. Anchored expectations means that the households believe that the inflation rate will be equal to a constant inflation rate by bar. This could be because the central bank was successful in communicating the policy that it sticks to an inflation target of, say, 2%, as the European Central Bank or the Fed did in the past. And households believe that. And if they believe that, then they would expect an inflation rate of 2%. In this case, we would have the original trade-off between inflation and unemployment, because then this would be equal to 2%, and there would be a trade-off between having uh, a higher um, uh, inflation rate, but in exchange, a lower unemployment rate. So the, um, uh, the, the economic policy could permanently decrease the unemployment rate below the um, natural unemployment rate, by accepting higher inflation than the inflation target of the central bank. The problem, of course, is how long would people believe in their anchored expectations if they observed by permanently higher inflation? And that might have been a problem in the 1970s where the Phillips curve relationship broke down because it might have been that it was um, existed before, but then people started to revise their expectations such that the Phillips curve vanished. Another option would be that we do not have anchored expectations, but naive or adaptive expectations, where households actually assume that the inflation rate in the next period is equal to the inflation rate that they observed in the previous period. So then the expected inflation rate as of today would be the inflation rate of the previous period. If we plug this into the expression here, so that the inflation expectation is the previous period, the previous period's inflation, then we get this expression here. And here we see that we do not have a trade-off where we can permanently decrease unemployment below the natural rate in exchange for having a higher inflation rate than the uh, expected inflation rate. Instead, we would have an accelerationing uh, inflation, ex uh, actually, accelerating inflation. Why? Because if I try to decrease unemployment below natural unemployment, this leads to higher inflation, but households would adjust inflation expectations upwards. And if I try to maintain the unemployment rate below the natural unemployment rate in the next period, I would have to accept an ever, uh, even higher inflation than the then higher expected inflation and so on and so forth. So inflation would accelerate whenever I try to permanently decrease the unemployment rate below the natural unemployment rate. And the natural unemployment rate is therefore in this setting also called the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, or the so-called NIRU, uh, because this rate would be consistent with a stable inflation rate over time. Now, in this case, there is no trade-off between the unemployment rate and the inflation rate, but there is a trade-off between the unemployment rate and the permanently higher um, uh, inflation rate as such. So decreasing the unemployment rate permanently below the natural um, level of unemployment would lead to permanently increasing inflation. Then we could have rational expectations and perfect foresight where households completely understand what the government is doing um, and they would immediately adjust their inflation expectations accordingly. So if this is the case, then they would always correctly predict inflation, and the difference between actual inflation and predicted inflation would always be zero, 
But this implies that the actual unemployment rate would always be equal to the equilibrium unemployment rate. So the, there are no policies that would allow to decrease the unemployment rate below the natural rate of unemployment. These policies are bound to fail because households would immediately uh, understand this policy and adjust their inflation expectations accordingly. Now we have two, three different types of expectations, rational expectations, adaptive expectations and anchored expectations. And of course, the question might arrive, which one um, of them is realistic? And actually, uh, none of them is really realistic. And it might be the case that some of them describe some periods better. So when the inflation, when there is the trade-off between unemployment and inflation, it might be that the um, anchored uh, expectations describe the situation best. When there is this accelerating inflation in the 1970s, it might be the case that the accelerationist Phillips curve and the naive and adaptive expectations fit better and so on. But in reality, it's quite likely that there is some form of hybrid expectations, where, for example, a share of the population has anchored expectations. This share, let's denote it by x1 here. Then a share x2 has naive expectations, and another share x2, x3 has rational expectations and perfect foresight. And then these shares could change over time. So if the central bank tries to do some policies that would uh, increase inflation, then more people could um, lose trust in the anchored inflation rate and um, uh, adopt uh, kind of naive expectations or rational expectations as uh, such, such that the policy would become less uh, effective. So overall, at some times, economic policies would be easier to conduct when expectations are anchored than in other periods. To summarize, the original Phillips curve posits a negative relation between the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. But when policymakers tried to exploit this um, relationship in the 60s and 70s, the Phillips curve actually vanished endogenously because um, households might have revised their expectations. In the 1970s, inflation accelerated and spiraled upwards, and this led to the disinflation policies of Paul Volcker as a Fed chairman in the 1980s. Modifications of the Phillips curve can account for this. So if we adopt um, naive um, expectations, actually, then we would have such an acceleration as a prediction of the Phillips curve. And with different expectation formation processes, it's possible to get different economic policy outcomes. So with rational expectations, we would have no trade-off between inflation and unemployment as such. With anchored expectations, we would have the original trade-off. And with naive or, and, or adaptive expectations, there would be no trade-off between the inflation uh, rate and unemployment, but a trade-off between permanently accelerating inflation and unemployment. And in reality, hybrid expectations are more likely to occur than such as the extreme cases here. And with hybrid expectations, you could have shares of the population that have different uh, expectations, and these shares could change depending on economic policies. So people could react endogenously to economic policies and change their beliefs in the expectation formation process. And this would in turn lead to different outcomes again of economic policies.